Hey everyone, welcome to another Clean Machine Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. I just want to make sure that everybody knows the disclaimer. <laughs> this video is for educational and informational purposes only. It is not intended to diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure any disease. Thank you for tuning in to another one. This is a really one that is very important to me. Um, being a man in this world and trying to come to grips what, with what our society, our modern society is defined as masculinity and what masculinity really means to me. And uh, I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation that will hopefully give some information. My goal here is not to get anybody to change. My goal here is to present information so that you have the information you need to make the best decision for your life. It's just information. It's not meant to persuade you either way. It's not meant to change your mind either way. It's meant to give you information that you can use or discard as you please. So lower the defenses. This is just information sharing, but I think you're gonna find it's powerful information and it shows quite a narrative how we as men have been talked into through marketing techniques uh, to consume a lot more of the things that are actually killing us and destroying our livelihood. And I want to just give you that information because if you do not want to follow that path of persuasiveness, of the marketing companies out there trying to get you to buy more of their products, then you might be interested in this PowerPoint. Okay, so let's dive into it. Uh, obviously the title gives it away, meet men, meat and masculinity, but this isn't just for men. I want women to see this too, because you have fathers, brothers, sons, um, that, uh, and, and husbands that definitely can be greatly impacted by this, not just in their health, but in almost every aspect of their life. So let's dive into it. I'm going to be reviewing the research and some of the thought processes that go into our current state. Okay, so this is a little bit about me. Um, I'm a natural bodybuilding and physique champion. That means drug free. I compete in tested shows, so uh, I'm tested drug free. I've been vegan for 37 years, and I was chosen by Plant Based News, uh, the top um, vegetarian vegan news uh, organization out there, as the top 100, number 40 out of the top 100 influential vegans in the world. So, you know, a lot of people will come to me and say, Hey, Jeff, you know, uh, you probably got there by eating meat. No. Uh, this is the picture on the left-hand side. That's me while I was eating meat. And you can see I was a scrawny little kid. And this is me after, on the right there, me after 37 years of being vegan. And then they'll say, but you're younger. That's why you can gain all that muscle. No, I actually turned 60 in January. Uh, then they said, well, then you must be using drugs. And of course, I am 100% drug free. I'm actually very passionate about being drug free and encouraging other people not to use drugs because I abused drugs in my early, in my late teens and early 20s, and it almost took my life. I am so grateful that I didn't lose my life to drugs that I will never, ever, ever touch them again. So I have lived for the last 37 years completely drug free. I'm so passionate about it. I named my company Clean Machine to encourage other people to keep this amazing machine that we're born into the human body clean, free of animal products, free of drugs, free of contaminants. I want people to live their best life. Uh, I suffered with clinical depression. And I don't want to see anybody suffer because I know what that kind of suffering feels like and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. 
Okay, so what are the key roles of masculinity? Uh, one of the major roles of masculinity is to be a good provider. Um, and providing in our early uh, ancestry meant uh, providing food. Well, now it's, it's more about uh, earning money and stuff, but we need, still need that to be a good provider for survival. A good protector. Uh, back then it meant against pr protecting against predators, uh, but now hmm, protecting against any known threats. Number three, virility and hence testosterone. Well, as you're going to see, some of the science will show that uh, going plant-based can actually increase your levels of testosterone and make you more virile and more vital. And then finally, reproduction. Obviously, we can't carry on our species if we can't reproduce. And I'm going to show you some staggering and really disappointing data that just came out uh, last month, I believe, showing that reproduction rates are men's sperm rates have dropped 52%. And I'm going to dive into some of the reasons why. Okay, so what is the perceived masculinity? That meat equals masculinity. And well, how do we arrive at that? Well, meat, we know it contains protein and that protein is what makes up our muscle and muscle is what gives us strength and strength is a key attribute to being masculine. But then we look at people who have developed that meat and muscle and we see that it defeats one of the key goals, which is survival. Here are four of the top uh, vegan bodybuilders. Um, let me see if I can get that better. There we go. And you can see me. Four of the top vegan body, not vegan bodybuilders, four of the top steroid using bodybuilders and dead at age 37, dead at age 46. Uh, Boston Lloyd, dead at age 29, and Cedric McMillan, dead at 44. None of these guys reached even 50 years of age, all dead of a heart attack. So this is not masculine to be dead. You can't be a good provider. You can't be a good protector. You can't <laughs> reproduce if you are dead. Okay, so the, this is a, a pretty disturbing statistic. A study done of a thousand people out of Australia found that 73% of men would rather reduce their life expectancy up to 10 years rather than stop eating meat. The research found that uh, both men and women actually preserved, uh, perceived meatier diets to be more than more masculine with 47% uh, viewing meat eating as a masculine undertaking. Well, if they're willing to give up 10 years of their life, seriously, just for the taste of meat? Well, unfortunately, the research shows that men actually will give up 13 years of their life by eating a standard American diet or a meat-centered diet. The, a sustained change from a typical Western diet to an optimal diet eating mostly fruits, vegetables, plants, nuts, grains, and seeds would increase life expectancy more than a decade for women, 10.7 years, and 13 years in men. Imagine adding 13 years to your life that you could spend with your families, your friends, traveling the world, spending the money that you've hard earned all your life. Why are they willing to give up so much of their life, so much of their ability to be masculine, to be a provider, to be strong, to be those things that are supposedly masculine? You're actually surrendering all of those masculine traits just for the taste of flesh. So women are about twice as likely as men to, to say they're eating less meat. And overall, it's been estimated that 80% of all the vegans in the United States today are women. So what is it about men that they're so resistant? Is it fear? I believe it's fear marketing that the meat and dairy industries 
have pushed this narrative that if you don't eat meat, you're not masculine. And you can see by that guy, and I'm not fat shaming, I'm saying that that guy is unhealthy. Not doesn't matter what size his belly is, but that is an unhealthy state. And that unhealthy state comes from lack of exercise and, of course, eating a standard American diet. So there's an interesting paradox here. It's actually called the meat paradox in, in the research circles and psychology or omnivores acrasia. And they describe omnivores acrasia as a state wherein one believes that non-human animals should not be harmed or killed, yet they continue to consume the very products even when they have access to alternatives, meat-free alternatives. Take my box out of here so you can see the rest of the slide. So the other study is called meat-related cognitive dissonance. Researchers have been especially interested in understanding how individuals morally care for animals. They love their pets. They, they cuddle with them. They play with them. They love them. They cry when they die. Simultaneously, we'll eat them as food. This is a big disconnect. Okay, and it's funny, Hippocrates uh, was, was famous for saying, before you heal someone, ask them if they're willing to give up the things that actually made them sick. And I think, you know, we, we need to look at, is that serving me? Is giving that up, really giving that up? Or like the next uh, image shows, one reason people resist change is because they focus on what they're giving up. I don't want to give up meat. I don't want to give up dairy. I don't want to give up eating like that. I don't want to give up my barbecues, you know, instead of what they have to gain. 13 years of life, 13 years of having fun, traveling, spending money, uh, you know, enjoying a relationship with someone. Just giving up 13 years of your life or a barbecue? Come on. You can still barbecue other things. There's you know, burgers and dogs and everything in, in plant-based versions. You don't have to give up 13 years of your life just to do that. It's what you focus on and what you are willing to give up. Okay, so, you know, the very first question that people ask me is, uh, where do you get your protein when they find out I'm vegan? But And it's ironic because all protein originates in plants. Uh, animals don't make proteins. They can take proteins apart and put them back together like a school child playing with blocks, but they don't make the blocks. Um, the plants do. Plants actually make all of the essential amino acids. They make all 20 amino acids that human beings use and need. All nine of the essential amino acids. From those nine essential amino acids, we make all of the proteins in our body. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and go to the next slide and you can see that the producers on the bottom, see this pyramid? It's called the trophic scale. This is biology 101. Uh, the plants are the producers of all the nutrition, all the essential amino acids, all the essential fatty acids like omega-3s and 6s. They're all made by plants. Animals don't make them. They cannot make them. That's why they're called essential because it's essential for humans and all other animals to get them from outside their body, from their diet. So everything is made by plants, all the fiber, all the carbohydrates, all the essential fats, all the essential amino acids, all the proteins, all made by plants, all the vitamins, all the minerals are made bioavailable by plants. So they even produce all the oxygen we breathe. So basically everything we need comes from plants with the exception of vitamin B12 and vitamin K2, which are both made by bacteria. Nothing, no nutritional requirement is made by exclusively by an animal. There is absolutely zero nutritional need to consume any animal for any reason, none. And that's biology 101. These are scientific facts. This is not an opinion. This is known. Look it up. Google it. You know, it's all over the place. But pull up any study and they'll say exactly the same thing. So the big question then becomes, 
well, why are we taking all this protein in plant form, all these essential fats, essential amino acids, vitamins and minerals, and then feeding them to an animal just to kill the animal and result in a very little amount of food? We take 41 million tons of food in plants, feed it to 7 billion livestock, and only result in 7 million tons of food. Now, if I told you, hey, I'll give you 40, uh, you give me $41 million and I'll give you 7 million back, would you take that deal? No, it's insane that we're reducing the amount of food from 41 down to seven. That's an extraordinary waste. And as our population grows, this is not sustainable. We cannot continue to take 41 million tons and you magnify that by the amount of people and the growth of the population, and it will just keep increasing the, how much food we're gonna need. We're gonna run out of planet to produce that much food if we keep feeding them to animals. It's just not mathematically sustainable. It's not possible. There's no need to feed it to an animal before you eat it, none. It's like saying, would you kill a person to take their money? No, you go out and make your own money just like you should go out and eat your own nutrients directly from the plants. Make your own money, eat your own plants. It's so simple. So if all muscle is made of protein and all protein is made of essential amino acids and all essential amino acids are made by plants, that means all muscle comes from plants. Whether you feed that as a plant essential amino acid to an animal first and then consume it doesn't matter. That essential amino acid came from a plant, and that is what your muscles are made of. So all of my muscle is made from plants. And it's almost 60 years old. That's a lot of muscle for a 60-year-old male. Okay, so, you know, some people will say, oh, but what about collagen? Collagen only comes from animals. Isn't collagen good for bone and good for joints and all this stuff? So here's a, here's a funny study. Well, they actually found a, a way to make collagen that's vegan, believe it or not. They took a bacteria and they genetically modified it so that that bacteria, when it ate protein, actually made human collagen. Now, it may sound a little creepy, but it's actually the perfect type of collagen for human beings. So they could make it from bacteria and no animals are harmed in the process of that. I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. But here's what happened. When they did a study, they compared it to, as a benchmark to vitamin C to see how well it increased collagen. So first they compared collagen that was human collagen the ones produced by the bacteria compared to animal collagen. And as you can see the dark graph there on the left, and it produced much more collagen and um, much more elastin. So these are two of the things that gives our complexity to our skin, the elasticity of our skin, it makes it look youthful and less wrinkly. And they found that this human collagen was better than all of the animal collagens they tested. Well, then they took this human collagen, since it beat out all the animal collagen, and they tested it against vitamin C. <laughs> Good old vitamin C from plants. Remember, you can't get vitamin C from animals. Animals don't make vitamin C. Well, some actually do. Carnivores, there are some carnivores that actually make their own vitamin C, but humans can't make their own vitamin C, so we must get it from plants. So vitamin C, compared to human collagen, which beat all the animal collagen, actually performed just as well at boosting collagen in humans. So getting eating an orange or a kiwi actually boosted collagen just as well as taking human collagen, which was better than the animal collagen. And not only that, it actually outperformed uh, human collagen and animal collagen in creating elastin. Good old vitamin C and all your fruits and berries and nuts and seeds and greens. <laughs> it's abundant in the plant kingdom. Uh, it's one of the, the few things that vegans generally don't want if they, at least they're eating a fair amount of whole foods in their diet. So there's no need for external collagen. This is a marketing ploy. This marketing ploy was developed by the 
meat producing industry. They were throwing away all this cartilage and they're like throwing away metric tons of this cartilage and saying, God, we should figure out some way to get humans to eat this stuff. And then they came up with this idea, oh, what about collagen? And they started doing studies on it and they found a way to get trick people into eating their garbage. <laughs> They got you to believe that somehow that eating this collagen from animals was going to benefit you so that they could make money off of their garbage from the meat industry. That's disgusting. But that's profiteering. <laughs> okay, so what about strength? Well, here is Kendrick Ferris, who's 100% vegan and setting the American record for the US Olympic weightlifting trials. That's right. The strongest male in the entire United States is vegan. The guy that holds the war, the US record for putting weight above its head. Incredible. So strength is not an issue. Don't believe the hype. Okay, but what about muscle gains? They say whey protein is the king of that. So they did a couple of interesting studies. The first one was eight weeks of uh, whey compared to rice protein. And they found that there was no difference between the two groups when they compared whey protein to rice protein. And they said, well, wait a minute, that's gotta be wrong because we all know that whey protein builds more muscle than, uh, than plant protein, right? So they did another study and this time they used pea protein <laughs> and they were even more embarrassed by the results of the study because the study, as you can see at the bottom, actually increased muscle 33% more than whey protein. Pea protein did. <laughs> That's right, a better muscle builder than whey protein. And there's the published human research right in front of you. You can look it up for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Well, they said, well, these are smaller studies. Let's take a look at a big study. So this one looked at over 40,000 people and uh, the Farmingham uh, third generation study, and they found absolutely no associations between protein clusters. That means if you're getting your protein from animals or if you're getting your protein from plants, no difference. The only difference was those who ate more protein did carry more muscle, which makes sense. You gotta eat sufficient amounts of protein to build sufficient amounts of muscle. So it is important to get protein, but how much protein? That's the next big question. So what do they use in the studies? Well, in the rice and whey study, they use 48 grams per day of rice protein. And in the pea protein study, they use 50, 50 grams of pea protein. So why did they use so much pea protein? And the bigger question, is too much protein bad for you? Well, this next study actually shows something pretty frightening. So this study actually showed when they looked at a large study of associations between how much protein you did take and how much uh, type of protein, it teased out some very interesting results. So they looked at protein levels, high protein in both plant protein, high protein and animal protein. And they found that there was a 75% increase in mortality. That's all cause mortality, all the reasons for death. 400% increase or four times increase in cancer death risk and a five times increase in diabetes when they were eating animal proteins. The same study showed these associations were either abolished, completely removed, or attenuated if the proteins were plant derived. So why did the plant protein not cause all these disease states, but the animal protein 400, 500% increase in cancer and diabetes? Well, let's take a look at what's in the proteins themselves. Why did the animal proteins cause disease and the plant proteins did not? One, animal proteins increase higher IGF-1. We know the reasons why. Higher methionine and cysteine, the actual amino acids that are inside animal proteins. You used to think, we used to think that um, methionine and cysteine are two amino acids that are essential. Our body needs them, but human bodies only need a small amount of those and they're much higher range 
within animal proteins. So let's go ahead and dive into that. All right, this is the IGF-1 study. And the reason why vegans don't have this impact, IGF-1 causes growth. Growth is a good thing. We need it when we sleep. We need it for healing and repairing. We need a little bit of IGF-1, but we don't want too much IGF-1 because it can stimulate bad cells or cancer cells to grow too. You don't want to stimulate cancer cell growth because then you can end up dying from metastasized cancer. So we need a little bit of IGF-1, not a lot. And it shows why vegans and vegetarians don't, because the high amounts of plants and plant fibers that we're eating actually bind to the IGF-1, keeping it safe so those IGF-1 can't stimulate cancer growth. They've shown a 20 to 40% higher IGF-1 binding proteins in vegans rather than those eating a meat-centered diet. So we protect our bodies from developing cancer just by eating more plants. Okay, these are the methionine and cysteine. And as you can see right here, the first red arrow shows uh, whey protein with 3.1 and pea protein only 0.8. So they used to think that, oh, whoa, 3.1 is much better than 0.8. Now we know just the opposite is true. Check out this study on the left-hand side at the bottom of the screen here, a review of methionine dependency. We now know that methionine feeds about 14 different cancer cells, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, uh, breast cancer, uterine cancer. Some of the major cancer killers of Americans are all what they call methionine dependent cancers. That means the cancer cell depends on methionine to spark its growth, which causes the metastasization and eventually the death of the human or the animal. So this high amount of methionine in dairy, you can see that three times as much methionine and cysteine in um, much higher in it. Methionine and cysteine can convert back together. And when you add those two together, you're talking two to three times as much of methionine and cysteine. And this is where uh, you can get cancer growth. In this study, as you can see at the bottom, in humans, vegan diets, which can be low in methionine, may actually prove to be a useful nutritional strategy in cancer growth control. We want lower levels of methionine. They're now actually putting people on who have cancer on low methionine diets. <laughs> you do that simply just by putting them on a plant-based diet and it's reversing and reducing cancer cells. That's amazing. Simply by eating the plants because of the makeup of the proteins. So animal proteins are different than plant proteins because of their actual amino acid makeup. And we used to think that the higher amounts of those amino acids was better. And we even called plant proteins incomplete proteins because they didn't have as much in there. Now we know just the opposite is true. It's better to have lower amounts in there. It, it, it's, it's not that the animal proteins have more and that's better. It's they have more and that's worse. It's leading to diseases. It's causing diseases like cancer and heart disease. Okay, so the next one is animal proteins cause diseases and not in plants. Animal iron versus plant iron. Heme iron is a known carcinogen. Heme iron is only found in animal flesh. And that's all animals whether you're eating uh, lamb or pig or a chicken or a goat or a cow or even a fish, they all have heme iron in them. Heme iron oxidizes in our digestive tract and forms carcinogenic in nitroso compounds. It is both, heme iron is both cytotoxic, means it damages cells, and genotoxic, which means it actually damages DNA. And when you damage that DNA, the DNA becomes aberrant and starts producing mutated cells. These are cancer cells. So we know the exact methodology of how heme iron found in every animal flesh, every single one, heme iron causing cancer in humans. And interestingly enough, in true carnivores, heme iron does not have this effect. It only has this effect in herbivores. Hmm, 
guess what humans are? Well, let's not even go there. Okay, cholesterol. And I know there's a lot of uh, controversy about cholesterol, but oxidized cholesterol is, you can see it. These are um, the, the little things that look like squid there on your left. Well, these are actually uh, dissections of, of arteries in the brain, blood vessels in the brain. You can see the top half is A, which is healthy uh, blood vessels in the brain. You can see how clear and open they are. And then you can see B below, and you see all those clogged arteries. Those white areas that are clogging those arteries are oxidized cholesterol. That is exactly what they're made of. And this oxidized cholesterol is causing closure of these, which is resulting in Alzheimer's disease. Those pictures below, those ones with all those clogged oxidized cholesterol, that is an all from Alzheimer's patients. That's what an Alzheimer's brain looks like. Now, dietary cholesterol is the only place you can get oxidized cholesterol. Oxidized cholesterol means it's cholesterol that has been heated, right? All animal protein, most people don't eat raw animal protein like, like carnivores do. They eat their protein from animals raw. Human beings cook their animal proteins. And when you heat that, the cholesterol in those animal proteins oxidizes. And that's what oxidized cholesterol in your brain looks like. And that's where Alzheimer's disease is founded. So just barbecuing that meat, you're basically setting yourself up to forget through Alzheimer's and suffer with your partners, with your family, not being able to recognize them, not being able to. It's, Alzheimer's is a horrible, horrific disease, and we know what causes it. It is right there for you. That is the brain on oxidized cholesterol. That oxidized cholesterol only comes from cooking of animal products, animal proteins. You, the human body does not make oxidized cholesterol. It prevents that cholesterol from doing it. But once you heat that animal protein, you cook it and you barbecue it, you bake it and you roast it, you are creating oxidized cholesterol that will impact those arteries, both to your heart and your brain and could lead to Alzheimer's disease. I, I give you this information because this information is important for you to have, to you to understand, so that you don't have to go through these horrific disease states, so that you can live a truly masculine life, be there for your family, be there for your loved one, your partner, be there for the people who care about you, who need you, who depend on you. That's why I give this information, not to make you right and me, me right and you wrong, or to be some agenda of a plant-based movement or something like that. No, because I care about other men. I care about other people, and I hate to see suffering because I suffered. I know what that feels like. So, you know, then they say, I, ha I hear so many people about the soy and the estrogen myth. Come on, let's, let's bury that already. Soy does not have any estrogen in it at all. It has phytoestrogens, which is up to 10,000 times weaker than actual estrogen found in chicken or fish or eggs or dairy. And what is an egg? Egg is an ovary of an, a female animal loaded with estrogen. What is what is milk? What is dairy? It is the lactation of a female animal loaded with estrogen. <laughs> what is a chicken? A chicken is a female animal loaded with estrogen. That's estrogen actually is what they breed into them. Chickens are now four or five times the size they used to be because they bred them to produce more estrogen and estrogen gets them to grow faster, grow bigger so that they can produce more meat. So this meat is the chicken, the fish, the dairy, the eggs are loaded with real estrogen which can be up to a thousand times more potent than the regular estrogen, than the phytoestrogens that are in plants. But there is one plant that is actually really high in phytoestrogen. <laughs> what, 20 times as high as soy? Oh, 50 times more potent than soy, actually. 
and it's hops found in beer. But you ain't going to stop, you ain't going to pry any dude from drinking, stop them from drinking beer, right? They'll drink beer till the day they die. And they're going to have the man boobs from that high 50 times more potent phytoestrogen than hops. But no, they won't touch the soy. <laughs> hops all day long. And they're, they're going to get those man boobs and fat bellies from all that estrogen. Okay, I get you. <laughs> all right. And then <clears throat> obviously the science right here please look up this study plant-based diets are associated with decreased risk of erectile dysfunction look there's nothing less virile than uh, a male with erectile dysfunction and i don't want to see anybody suffer with that and if it's just your diet contributing to this well why does that happen why because eating animal products has cholesterol and saturated fat which clog the arteries or reducing the blood flow to the genitalia they do that to the heart, they do that to the brain, they do that to heart, you get heart attacks, you do it to the brain, you get uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and you do it to the genitals. It's all the clogging of the arteries. That's all it is. You need blood flow to have an erection. Without that blood flow, if you're clogging the arteries full of this saturated fat and cholesterol, you don't get blood flow to the genitalia, you can't have erection. It's really that simple. And the good news is, that eating whole food plants actually boosts nitric oxide, which increases the ability to have an erection. It is full of anti-inflammatory antioxidants, polyphenols, butyrate, all these good things that actually help improve blood flow to the genitalia, both for women and men. And women need blood flow to the genitalia to increase their sensitivity, to increase their pleasure too as well. So it's both great for sexual health for men and women. It's that simple. And obviously prostate cancer. This study showed that eating just two and a half eggs per week increases men's risk of prostate cancer, lethal prostate cancer, not just getting it, but dying from prostate cancer, 81%. Now you can say, all right, well, we'll just get prostate surgery and remove the prostate. Well, after prostate surgery, <clears throat> impotence rate amongst men was up to 75%. So yes, you can get your prostate removed and then 75% of those men will never be able to have sex again. Is that really worth eating two and a half eggs a week? Seriously. You, you, if you focus on what you're giving up, you're, what you're really giving up is not giving up eggs. That should not be your worry. You should be worrying about never having sex again in your life or even dying from prostate. That's what you should be worried about. That's what you should be uh, concerned about. Not giving up eggs, but giving up your sex life. To me, oh my God, <laughs> scrambled tofu is awesome don't need don't miss eggs and i do enjoy still being at 60 and having a good sex life okay so this study actually raised a few eyebrows because it showed that actually vegans have higher levels of testosterone now higher levels of testosterone aren't, isn't necessarily a good thing because you don't want your levels to be too high because then it can actually stimulate cancer growth, just like IGF-1 do. So our bodies actually produce what's called sex hormone binding globulin, which actually helps uh, men with higher levels of testosterone, like vegans. Um, and th that way it, the, it binds it to them and only releases that testosterone when they need it, making it safe so it doesn't produce uh, or put them at higher risk for um, different forms of cancer. So yes, vegans have higher levels of testosterone, but they also uh, produce a sec more sex hormone binding globulin to bring that back down to the normal range. And actually meat eaters and vegans have about the same bioavailable testosterone because the body doesn't want to uh, have two levels, two high levels. But you can see the virility, as far as virility and sex hormones are produced, vegan men higher in testosterone. Okay, this is the study that's, that's truly disturbing. This study is called a meta-regression analysis. It's looking at a whole bunch of studies, included 
185 studies conducted between 1973 and 2011 involving over 43, almost 43,000 men. The team found that sperm concentration in men fell by 52.4%. This is horrible. Now, some might say, well, that's a good thing because we're overpopulating and <laughs> that means a lot more men out there are shooting blanks. And what's a little scarier is the next line that was in the study. And while sperm counts have been dropping for decades, the decline rate actually appears to be speeding up we may have within the next decade or so a situation where the vast majority of men are shooting blanks are not able to have children why that's a big question well here's the actual graph from the study the sperm rate declining and you can see going from 101 million sperm per milliliter down to 49 million Look at that precipitous drop from 1972 to 2000. It is dropping like a rock. Now, why is that? Why are sperm rates and men globally dropping? Because of meat. Worldwide since the 1960s, dietary protein primarily came from plant-derived products, such as wheat. Nowadays, almost 60% of all the protein availability comes from animal proteins. Look at that graph. Now look at the graph on the left, and you can see the protein, animal protein intake skyrocketing up. Look at the graph on the right, and you can see just almost the exact rate of incline is the rate of decline in sperm in men. Coincidence? Corollary? Well, let's take a look at this because yes, you could say, oh, that just, just happens to be the case and there's no causation there. Okay, well, let's look at this next study then. The study actually took vegan men and non-vegan men, meat-eating men, and compared where they were at in total sperm count. The first graph on the left showed 188% higher sperm count in vegan men than those men eating meat. Almost 200% higher sperm count. I believe that gap is going to continue to increase because we see the increased intake of men eating meat and the rapid stone drop decrease of sperm in meat-eating men. Now you look on the second graph on the right, the percentage of rapid motile sperm. These are healthy sperm, sperm that are strong, sperm that actually can reach the egg and penetrate the wall and, and cause a pregnancy. Vegan men had 17 times higher sperm motility than meat-eating men. That meat-eating men full of cholesterol and saturated fat was producing lethargic sperm, sperm that could barely swim, sperm that had 17 times less swimming strength and endurance, not able to penetrate, not enough strength to penetrate the, the egg, not enough to impregnate the woman, the, the, the egg, the ovum. But that would be bad enough for any men trying to have a pregnancy. The sentence below these two graphs is probably even more disheartening. And I'll read it right from the, furthermore, the oxidation reduction potential of the proportion of spermatozoan, that sperm, with DNA damage was significantly higher in the vegan group compared in the non-vegan group compared to the vegan group. DNA damage was almost double in the meat-eating group. That means a much higher likely chance 
of having a deformed child, a mentally impaired, impaired child, a child with health conditions or faulty functioning. Come on, is meat eating really that important that you could damage your own child before it's even born? Why? There's no need for this. You see, this is an actual published human study showing the difference between what eating plants and what eating animals does to your sexual health, your ability to reproduce, your ability to have healthy, normal children. Why? Because the taste of meat, really? That you're going to look in your your wife's or your partner's eyes and say, I'm sorry our child came out deformed or mentally handicapped. I like my meat. Really? You can say that? All right. Why are men so entrenched in this? I believe a lot of it is due to fear of judgment from their peers. If I change to a, to a plant-centered diet, people are going to make fun of me. People are going to say I'm a wuss. People are going to say I'm wrong. They'll isolate me. They won't invite me to their barbecues. They won't want to hang out with me or many more because they're fear I'm going to judge them. I get that. It's tough. It is difficult. But isn't that what being man a manly is about? Standing up for what's right? I'm not going to have... Uh, my sexual health taken from me. I'm not going to have disease states and, and Alzheimer's disease. I'm not going to let that happen to me. And I'm going to stand up to all that fear of judgment. That's bravery. Isn't that a true value of masculinity? To be brave, to stand up for what's right in the face of the judgment of your peers? Yeah, that's what I believe masculine behavior looks like, is to stand up and be challenged and do the right thing for you and your family and the people you care about, regardless of what other people say. That's bravery. That's masculine. Cultural and social norms. This is a learned behavior to eat meat. We do not need to eat meat. There's no nutritional reason for it. It's just a social norm. And yes, once you break free of those social norms, chances are some people are going to treat you differently. That's okay. You get the benefit of having a healthy life. You get the benefits of having a healthy sex life. They won't. And they'll come to you looking for answers once they start having all those disease states. So all of these are different ways that you can talk with people, talk with the men in your life, talk with yourself if you're male. Why am I doing this? Is it really worth all that? Is it worth giving up my sex life? Is it worth having prostate cancer? Is it worth having Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, being debilitated, having improperly unhealthy children or no children at all? Is it really worth all that for the taste of flesh when there's so many alternatives out there? I share this information not to make anybody wrong. I share this information because what we have chosen as a society to do to ourselves is wrong. It's not you against me. It's us against information that is bad information that is killing us and destroying our lives and taking things from us that are rightfully ours. Our ability to have a healthy life all the way to 100, to be able to have a normal, healthy sexual life to have a, a healthy family that grows up healthy and, and not to deal with all these health issues, to have all your money taken away by hospital bills, by medications, by treatments and surgeries. You work too hard for that money. Wouldn't you rather go on vacations and enjoy them? That's why I give this information. That's why I provide this type of information every week. I hope you'd enjoy this information. And please, if you have any questions, uh, check out you know, the rest of the videos. I offer all of this information to help. I offer all of this information because I care and because I hate to see suffering. 
it's not about being right or wrong. It's not about the dogma of some, you know, cult of veganism or whatever. It's not about that at all. It's about human suffering, human health, and making good decisions based on the information. We didn't know a lot of this stuff. We were socially trained. It's not our fault. But when we have this information, when it's clear that the science is overwhelming, that these social dogmas that have been created, these fears, these pressures, these marketing techniques that the meat and dairy industry have lobbied to try to get you in a fearful state so you continue to buy and use and eat their products. And it's killing you. It's destroying your life. It's taking from you. You will end up paying for health insurance and for doctor bills and for uh, pharmaceutical drugs and stuff, all because they have convinced you out of fear to control you to keep buying and using their products. You don't have to listen to that lie anymore. I hope you don't. I hope you get to be around and really enjoy a long and prosperous life. I hope all that money you worked so hard for all your life actually gets to, you get to spend it enjoying it with your wife, your kids, your family, friends. Go out and have a great time. That's why you work hard. That's why you're a good provider. That's why you are masculine because you'll stand up to these falsehoods this propaganda and this fear baiting that is nothing but marketing that is trying to convince men through fear to continue eating this crap that's killing us it's wrong and i share this information to empower you not to try to take away anything from you but to give you something I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please give it a like. Please give it a thumbs up. Please leave a comment. This all helps this get seen by more people. Please share it if you feel so inclined. This can help people. Share it with friends who might want to hear this message. I do this with science-based information. You can look it up. All the links are in the studies right posted right on the screen. Don't take my word for it or anybody's word on YouTube by, <laughs> by that matter. Research it yourself so that you trust the information and that you use that information for the best health and the best life you can live. Thank you for joining me. We'll be back every Thursday, except for during the holidays. We'll probably take a break for the next couple of weeks as my wife and I go on vacation. Uh, but uh, you can enjoy this and have a great time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in.